Hi, I'm Dr. Herb Schneider. I want to talk to you tonight about prostate cancer, and I want to share further some experience that we've had here in Columbus, Ohio. Cryoablation is a technology that uses very cold temperature to destroy prostate cancer. The unique features, we can eliminate the problem without any incisions, simply by placing needles, cryoprobes, into the prostate and with ultrasound guidance, eliminate the problem. Now, I'm going to share with you our experience and there will be significant detail. I want you to understand though that here on the web you're just going to see a very brief uh, synopsis of this program. At the end of this program, however, you'll be directed uh, to information that you can contact our office at Riverside Urology in Columbus, Ohio, and you can obtain the detailed presentation. Third generation cryoablation has come about since 1999, and what we're going to deal with tonight is biopsy proven clinically localized prostate cancer as measured by real-time biopsy and PSA assay. This is an ice ball that we formed in the area of a prostate that at least theoretically in this case has cancer in it. And what we're showing you is that we can engulf this entire prostate in lethal ice. We call that sculpting the ice ball and having the ability to freeze and cool in the same cryoprobe helps us immensely in accomplishing that objective. <clears throat> this demonstrates the Joule-Thompson effect. The Joule-Thompson effect basically is that when argon is passed through a very small opening and expands, it generates very cold temperatures. On the other hand, if we use helium and pass helium through the uh, very small opening or the venturi, that heats and heats in this case up to almost 70 degrees centigrade. Between 2001 and 2005, 77 men were treated who had biopsy proven clinically localized uh, prostate cancer and we used third generation technology. These are patients who had not had prior treatment. In other words, they weren't previously treated with surgery or radiation. Preoperative studies uh, included MRI, a bone scan, CT, and at times, prostacin scans. Here is a, a overview of the cases that we studied. Our 77 men, their average age was 72. Uh, the median PSA was six, about six, and uh, the Gleason scores, as you can see here, 53% uh, were uh, Gleason six, uh, about 40% Gleason seven, and then our very high grade cases, eight and nine, uh, had a total of six patients. Now this fits the Amico uh, risk group and <clears throat> the bulk of our patients in that category are in the intermediate group, as you can see. Here is a graphic representation of this process in action. This is the ice ball, and as you uh, can see, it conforms well to the prostate, and that's because of the ability to freeze and thaw, which um, gives us the ability to sculpt the ice ball. We also have thermistors, uh, which tell us what the temperature is between the prostate and the rectum, so that we don't damage the rectum and yet freeze the prostate completely. And uh, the other uh, thermistors tell us about temperatures such as in the sphincter. Our follow-up consisted of physical examination, PSA at uh, three month intervals for the first uh, two years and then six month intervals thereafter. 
Uh, PSA failure was when the PSA was greater than uh, 0.5 nanograms per mil, and transrectal ultrasound biopsies were performed at 6, 12, and 18 months. Men with <clears throat> positive biopsies were retreated. At 48 months, about half the men in this group had <clears throat> both negative biopsies and PSA that was below 0.4 nanograms, suggesting no evidence of disease. If we look at biopsy alone, 61% uh, of our men, or 47, had three negative biopsies. 12 men, or 15.6%, had two negative biopsies. And six men, or about 8%, had one negative biopsy. For a total then of 65 men at four years, who had, had at least one negative biopsy. 12 men had a positive uh, biopsy. The diagnosis was early and therefore gave us the opportunity to treat these patients promptly. And it is interesting that actually the biopsies were positive before the PSA was, which is somewhat counter to the current methods of judging success or failure of cryoablation, which for the most part is done biochemically. Most of our patients that failed actually had a PSA that was less than one. And in many circumstances, or other ways of follow-up, that would be considered within the normal range. This was new information. Biochemical response, or what the PSA told us, 68% of our men by PSA were considered uh, free of disease with no evidence to suggest problem. 11 of our men were uh, retreated. One of the 12 who failed had died of other cause. Of those 11 men, all subsequently had negative biopsies after retreatment but two of the men required two treatments to get to negative uh, biopsy. Additionally, our report uh, tells us that cryoablation is measured by serial biopsies, which have not previously been utilized, is a very good method because it gives us the opportunity to make the diagnosis if we do have a failure early and that's when the PSA may not even indicate failure. So, <clears throat> if the cancer is localized, and we use this minimally invasive uh, treatment strategy, and we monitor it with serial PSA and biopsies, uh, we really don't have much in the line of problems with side effects, and if there is a failure, we'll diagnose it early and can retreat it, and in, in my view, have a very good outcome. Now here is a, a graph that simplifies a lot of what we've discussed. But as you look at it, 49% uh, of our patients had three negative biopsies. 84% had at least one negative biopsy. And 87% by PSA criteria had no evidence to suggest disease. 15% did uh, manifest failure. This uh, graphic shows what we did with our failures. Now, we had 12 failures, but we uh, treated only 11 because one gentleman had died, not of cancer, but of other cause. And of those 11 treated, 10 were successful as measured by having negative biopsies, and one showed a positive biopsy and is still considered failure. So, <clears throat> this is an overview of uh, current literature regarding this treatment. 
And in summation, I think we can say that we now have a truly minimally invasive treatment strategy that we have very good reason to believe can not only cure prostate cancer, but is competitive with all the other treatment options that are currently being used.